everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And this is a special episode uh, that we're doing for Civil Rights Day for Martin Luther King's Day, which is coming up on Monday. And we're titling this uh, The Politics of Revelation, a behind the scenes look at the 1978 uh, lifting of the priesthood ban. I think you're going to find this pretty interesting. Well, I certainly found it interesting as we started to research it. I learned a lot that I had no idea of before. I think all of us have heard, of course, of the lifting of the priesthood ban. I myself like to call that the eternal family ban because that's really what it was. I mean, when you don't have the priesthood, you don't have an eternal family. And that's the bottom line. And I think if you take it to its natural conclusion, you see that that is what it is. So I was not aware, you know, of course, you hear the revelation. Um, and in June of 1978, but I was not aware of everything happening behind the scenes, the politics of it that were literally going on for decades. So we decided to look into this and Landon has put together some extremely informative slides and let's just get going and jump right in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead here and, and share the screen and uh, kind of explain what is on each of the slides here. Um, as I said, we're gonna call this uh, the, the politics of, a, of revelation, a behind the scene look at the 1978 lifting of the priesthood ban. And as, as Rebecca just said, uh, I think often when you think of the priesthood ban, you think of, of you know the, the priesthood being barred from black men, and you don't think of what you just said, the extension that it affected the entire family. In essence, you know, as, a, as an LDS member, the temple and those covenants and the marriage and the ceiling, those are the, the highlights of being a member of the church. And that was all not allowed for, for black families. That just wasn't a, an option. So it really was a, a disturbing, a very hard reality if you were if you were a person of color uh, back in the back in before 1978. We're going to start out in order to understand the politics and all that went into the lifting of the priesthood ban. We first have to kind of give a history of the of the priesthood ban itself. Um, it actually goes back. It, it, it's interesting because in 1836, a man named Elijah Abel, who was a black convert to the church, was ordained as an elder. So this is just six years after the church has been uh, started, and here you've got a a, a black man who is ordained as an elder, and he was later uh, put in the 70 in December, and he remained a member in good standing, and Joseph Smith approved of all of this. And so right from the beginning, blacks were allowed to hold the priesthood, and of course, they were always allowed to be baptized, but here, here's an example of where they were able to hold the priesthood. And there were, I, I believe there was at least two uh, black men who hold, held the priesthood under Joseph, when Joseph Smith was around. So it, it, it isn't something new. It's it's uh, th this was happening right from the beginning of the church. So when did it when did it stop, or when could when did they take this right away from them? Can well, I make a guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, you can guess by the. My picture. guess is right there on the slide. <laughs> That's right. He's it, it's the man who seems to screw everything up <laughs> for the church. But oh. uh, when, when you, it's funny when you watch the the uh, if you look at any of the apologetics on this up until the uh, the priesthood ban essay gospel topic essay, the church would always say we really don't know where this started or where this policy came from. And in reality, we know we know exactly where it came from. Uh, in, in 1852, Brigham Young declares the seed of Cain cannot hold the priesthood. And if no other prophet ever spake it before, I will say it now. And basically, from that point on, uh, blacks were not allowed to hold the priesthood. And it's interesting as you go through from this point all the way up to almost 1978, the things that the different prophets and the different apostles say are are very disturbing as you read them. They're they're hard to read almost on what they say about this topic. So we definitely know when the when the ban started, and the church, you know, the the prophets, uh, or at least Brigham Young and and others are saying that it's because they're the seed of Cain that they were refused the the priesthood. Right, so, the curse of the dark skin, all the, of that. Yeah. Yes, a absolutely. So. Uh, if we if we jump ahead from from the time of Brigham Young, we jump up, and the next time we really see a big pro proclamation is in 1947, 
And then George Albert Smith uh, was the was the president of the church. And at that in that year, they sent a, a letter to a Dr. Lowry Nelson. Now, Dr. Nelson was a, a member of the church who was having a really hard time with this priesthood ban and saying, why are we not allowing these people to to uh, hold hold the priesthood? And uh, if you if you go back and forth in the letter, it's kind of interesting because they 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 basically say, who are you to question this? Why why can you question this? Uh, and and they write back and and they basically tell him um, from the days of the prophet Joseph, even until now, it has been the doctrine of the church, never questioned by any of the church leaders, that the Negroes are not entitled to the full blessings of the gospel. Furthermore, our ideas as we understand them appear to contemplate the intermarriage of the Negro and white races, a concept which has heretofore been most repugnant to most normal-minded people from the ancient patriarchs till now. God's rule for Israel, his chosen people, has been endogamous. Modern Israel has been similarly directed. We are not unmindful of the fact that there is a growing tendency, particularly among some educators, as it manifests itself in this area toward the breaking down of race barriers in the matter of intermarriage between whites and blacks, but it does not have the sanction of the church and is contrary to church doctrine. This, this, is a, this statement by the First Presidency is interesting in several uh, things. First off, at, at the very end, he says it is church doctrine. We often hear that it was policy, uh, that, it's, that it wasn't doctrine, and that's why it could change, because Doctrine cannot change. Therefore, when you say it's doctrine, you're saying that it's it's unchangeable. Uh, well, that's so, what they say today on so many different issues where it, they try to flip flop and say it was doctrine, it isn't, it was policy, back and forth. So yeah, they're, they're definitely calling a lot of things now policy rather right. than doctrine. And and it's interesting that so many of these definitions were right in you know Mormon doctrine. And doctrines <laughs> of salvation the is written in the books called doctrine. You know? Right. Well, no, you're so right, though. This is this is really hard to read, extremely hard to hear. I'm also kind of surprised that they would actually even answer a letter from somebody because that doesn't necessarily usually happen today. <laughs> right? It circles back. But yeah. And to just see that this is George Albert Smith and, you know, the prophet and, and these are his words. It's, it's hard to hear. Yeah. The, the thing that really caught my eye was this, uh, you know, from the days of the prophet Joseph Smith, even until now, it has been the doctrine of the church. Again, they re twice he calls it the doctrine of the church. But the next, the next little part is the interesting part. Never questioned by any of the church leaders. You think about this, you know, this is 1947. Brigham Young was back in 1852. Between 1852 and, and 1947, we fought a civil war over the question of slavery. Over the issue, exactly. Yes. And exactly. and we had the Emancipation Proclamation during this time. And during all of that, nobody bothered to question this policy or how they should deal with this? Basically, they're saying the rest of the world um, was questioning, was making strides, was trying to improve, trying to right this great atrocity. But in the church, no one was thinking that way or thinking anything needed to change yeah yeah you just it, it, it's the lds way you do not question uh what's in the past you don't question what a former prophet said and so to me this shows the danger of not questioning things that the danger of teaching people don't question authority don't question policy don't question doctrine uh, because this should have been questioned at some point in that hundred years so, well, I would like to think that many members were questioning, but just didn't know how to formally question or, you know, and even a lot of leaders, I would think that they were, I would hope that they were seeing that this is not right. Yeah. And, and we also had um, statehood, uh, you know, Utah became a territory and they decided to be a slave territory that slaves were allowed and they never questioned this, you know, again, mm -hmm. So many things happened in this hundred years in race relations, and they never even bothered to question, according to uh, George Albert Smith in, in his response. So uh, the next big thing that happened was in 1949, so just two years later, but the first presidency uh, put out a statement. And in this, uh, in this statement, they clearly said that it's the position 
uh, of the church that blacks will not get the priesthood. Uh, it's always been there. It will always be there. And they make it very clear that that uh, they are not going to receive receive the priesthood. So here we have 1947, a statement in a letter. But here, this is an official, just like the proclamation of the family, this is a proclamation to the whole church and to the whole world that they will not allow the blacks to hold the priesthood. And, and that it is doctrine. How, sorry, how was this presented? Was it in meetings? Was it read over the pulpit? Was it? Um, I'm I'm guessing it was read over the pulpit uh, in conference, but it was okay. it was definitely a a letter from the first presidency okay. to the to the church. Instructing so instructing the membership just to yes. make sure they understood and we're all on the same page. Okay, it, exactly. So th this is 1947. So this is you know or 1949. You know we've just had World War II where. Uh, the blacks fought in in the World War II as soldiers, and and they were starting to reclaim some of their some of their rights, or or they were trying to get those in. And he, here again, the first presidency just just shut it down. Shut it down. That's the word I was just going to say. Shut it down. Shut it down. So 1954. This is an interesting year because uh, uh, David O. McKay continues the priesthood ban uh, for people with African lineage after requesting a revelation from God. Uh, he reportedly said that he asked for a revelation to overturn the, the ban, but had not had the answer he sought. Now, this is really interesting, because 1954 is really the year that we attribute to the start of the Civil Rights Movement. So right at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, the prophet of God went to God and said, I, I think this is should be overturned. Uh, and he sought a revelation, but he didn't get it. How different would the would the church have looked if in the beginning of the civil rights movement, they'd had a revelation and they said, we're going to do this. They would have been progressive. The, the prophet would have been looking like he was prophetic. Uh, instead, it's it's uh, what seventy eight is uh, twenty four years later after the whole civil rights movement is over before we Once we it's get a done deal. Yeah, it's hard to uh, you know be a progressive in that way, right? It's hard to take that stand. But imagine if they would have. That's yeah. You know. it, it certainly would have shown uh, some some leadership in in the civil rights rather than than followership. And one more thing I wanted to add about that quote is that, again, it says, we, the brethren, we wish we could do this. We want to do this. We're pleading with the Lord to do it. But who is it that really doesn't want to give the priesthood? It, it's God. It's yeah. God himself. So that's God hard to won't give it to him. Yeah, God it's God. It's not us. <laughs> very it's, it's not me. It's you. Or it's not you. It's me. However you want to say it. Yeah, yeah. that's really hard to read. And we're definitely going to see that. So uh, the next the next slide here is is the Brazil question, and this is this is really interesting because I don't think most members even have a clue about how big of a part Brazil played in the lifting of the priesthood ban. And I'll go over a little bit about why that is and and how it played such an important role in the lifting of the priesthood ban. Um, in 1959, Spencer W. Kimball was assigned responsibility over the Brazil Brazil area, and he went down. He made he made quite a few trips down there. And as he got down there, obviously, what happens is you get to know the people and you get to love the people, just like if you're a missionary. And Spencer W. Kimball really saw these people for what they were, and actually, you know, really had compassion on them uh, as he spent from 1959 uh, on. So. Uh, that same year that he went down there, they opened a second mission in Northeast Brazil. So they, they had a, you know, Brazil as a whole was a mission, but they split it and they, they made a Northeast mission. Well, Brazil is, is highly a uh, mixed race. So 40, I think it's 40% of the population has black an ancestry or African-American ancestry because it was it, they also had slaves and it went much later than in the US. And so it was a much uh, more mixed society. The problem was when they opened the Northeast Brazil mission is only 10 to 20% of the population could be investigators. 
because in the Northeast, that's where most of the most of the blacks lived. It'd be much like the South here in the United States. It was the Northeast that contained most of the blacks. And so they opened up this mission and they really couldn't teach anybody. So that that became a real problem right off the right off the bat. So several I understand it. They it's literally one drop of blood. <laughs> like there, it's it, it was interesting because you know that poses a and this was part of the problem that the church was having is how do you decide if a person is black if they're if they're mixed uh, you know right. if they've mixed with a different race and so this was a problem that the missionaries had they're going up and they're they they teach someone and they may they may have a darker skin and so now you have to determine whether they have african ancestry so you can determine whether they can be baptized and this was just throwing everybody for a loop. And Spencer W. Kimball saw this issue because they're going, how do you decide? And so they came up with this policy, you know, if you, you know, if you look, if you look too black, then we're going to have to look at your geneal genealogical records and try to determine if you have African ancestry. If and you're then eligible if, then for the priesthood. That's so you'd incredible. be eligible. So then they went even further because, you know, they if they didn't couldn't tell from the genealogical records, another way is the patriarch would have a revelation as to what, you know, basically what tribe you're from, <laughs> whether you have African descent in you. So you've got, you know, patriarch roulette where they're looking at different people saying, yeah, you're good. You're not good. You're good. And, and everyone was just in confusion. So you can see this is a very difficult doctrine to enforce when you're saying that any African blood disqualifies you. So even if you look white, but but you can determine in your genealogy that you have African ancestry, you would be you you wouldn't be allowed to be baptized. So this was very problematic to the church. And, and I don't know if you remember um Sandra Tanner when I uh was part of the interview with her um on Mormon Stories Book Club. It was John DeLynn and Ronald Huggins, the author of her book Lighthouse. And it was me and it was uh, Sandra Tanner. And we were talking about this issue, of course, because she lived through all of this, you know, and she was absolutely a champion for civil rights the entire time. She was prophetic. Um, but she told the story of a young man in, I can't remember, I think you watched the episode Small Town in Utah. Um, he did not appear to be of mixed race at all. He was given the priesthood. And then this is what jogged my memory on this story. Um, someone looked into his genealogy or somehow it was discovered in his background that what he was indeed very far back of mixed race. Although he did not appear, you would never looking at him think that. And Sandra said, they literally, she she said they stripped the priesthood from that boy. That's how she put it. They literally took the priesthood back, which as she pointed out in a small Utah town back in, I don't know if it was late 50s, 60s, you know, what what chance did this boy, have? you know, who can he date? How can he participate? You know, it was a, she just told this, just shaking her head, just this story. So it was very real and it touched lives and it impacted lives. And I just, I never forgot that story that she told. And what happens if that boy got older before it happened and, and did get married yeah. and now he's married in the temple and now all of a sudden you come back and say, oh, we've got to strip your priesthood. And that means all of your temple. Yeah. Uh, you and your wife are no longer sealed and your children are not born in the covenant. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a rabbit hole when you start thinking about it. It's not just a priesthood ban, it's everything all the ordinances in the in the church it's all of it. it it's really spiritual slavery because it just like when when the blacks would come to america and and they you know they tear the the wife away from the husband they tear the children and split up the families and it was like you don't have the right to be a family because you're property and they're basically saying you don't we're tearing you apart or we're keeping you apart you have no right to be a family in the eternities because of the color of your skin. Right. And, and God doesn't want you to be a family. And, and, God, and, and it's God doing it. It's not it's us. Not it's us. It's, it's him. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Yeah. So uh, 1966, uh, the first stake was formed in Brazil. And this leads to some some things. But, um, oh, I skipped, I skipped a part here. Um, 1963, this is an important part. Uh, Kimball, Spencer W. Kimball, 
because of all these challenges and all these problems, he recognized and he even said this ban may be an error. Uh, in other words, okay, this yeah. is the first time that you really hear a, a, an apostle saying, you know, our doctrine may have an error in it, and we may need to do something about this to fix it. And really, Spencer W. Kimball was kind of the first person to recognize that. And so he kind of, at, at that point, after seeing the, the Brazilians and after seeing uh, the problems that were down there and after trying to administer this for so, for so many years, he came to the conclusion that something's got to be done here. And he kind of made it his life work to make sure that this got overturned. So and he was an apostle at this time, we should probably point out. And, yeah. and president was David O. McKay. Uh, yes, I believe it was David O. McKay at that point. So right. um, so it's interesting because I think in the church, we so often thought, oh, it was the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King movement, that all happened. And then you had, you know, football teams wouldn't play BYU. And you hear the rumor yeah. that President Carter said that he, you know, that they were going to lose their tax status and everything. Well, the interesting thing is um, uh, when you look at the papers of the you know, Spencer W. Kimball's writings and stuff, they really seemed to care very little about what was going on in the United States. It was really Brazil that that drove the change, not the United States. They they said, we can handle the pressure that we're getting in the United States, but it's causing problems uh, for the church in Brazil. And, and so Brazil was so attractive to them because there were so many people that wanted to join. It was about membership or so many people that would be paying tithing. It was about money. It, it mean, became a hot, see? yeah, it became a hot, uh, people were joining very quickly. Right. And so the growth was happening very rapidly. And so the church is saying, oh, this is a good thing, except, oh, we can't, we can't baptize. A we can't offer them full benefits at this point. So. Exactly. So that that's where it became a problem. So I want. I do want to turn back to the U.S. a little bit to give some perspective of what's happening in the U.S. at this time, uh, so that you you can kind of compare and contrast. in In 1954, as we said, that's when the civil rights movement really started. Um, in 1962, George Romney, Mitt Romney's father, ran for governor of Mich of Michigan, which we all know that Michigan is heavily uh, has a large population of of blacks and colored people. Um, and during that, the Negro policy became an issue for the church. And they kept, it, it was amazing because the apostles are kind of saying, eh, that's all they focus on because George Romney is, is a stake president. I think he was a stake president, uh, uh, but he was very involved in the church. And he, he's running for governor in a state that's highly uh, black. And yet he's a member of this church that openly discriminates against blacks during a very a time of racial tension. And so uh, this was giving the church a lot of negative press. And the apostles were just going, why don't they pick on someone else? I, they just focus on this one issue. They're not, we're, we're, they're portraying us in a bad light. And so it really kind of upset the church, but they still had no desire to change anything and they weren't going to give in. And in, uh, in, 1964, uh, Apostle Delbert Stapley uh, wrote a letter to jo uh, George Romney talking about the civil uh, about the civil rights bill, and uh, it's interesting what he said um, in the letter. He said, uh, and, "and this is you know the position of of an apostle." Uh, he said, "I am not against the civil rights bill if it conforms to the views of the Prophet Joseph Smith." <laughs> That makes perfect sense. <laughs> According to the references above given. So, you know, here's the Martin Luther King. They're all out marching for civil rights. And it's like, well, they've got to listen to Joseph Smith before we, you know, they've, they've got to look at Joseph Smith's teachings before we have a civil rights bill. He said, I fully agree the Negro is entitled to considerations also stated above, but not full social benefits nor intermarriage privileges with the whites nor should the whites be forced to accept them into restricted white areas. In my judgment, the present proposed Bill of Rights is vicious legislation. And this <laughs> so, is an apostle. This is Delbert Stapley saying this. Oh, my goodness. Yes. In an open letter to the governor of Michigan uh, at the time, uh, George Romney. 
Um, so the Civil Rights Act, 1965, the Civil Rights Act, and there was the 1964 Voting Rights Act. So uh, this is, you know, right at, at this time is when the, the legislation is passed. And so you can almost see that the church actively worked against the civil rights movement when they're writing letters like that and saying, you know, we don't we don't uh, accept this or we we think it's vicious legis legislation. So we've got to step back a little bit here then and, and talk a little bit about Hubie Brown uh, and, and say a few things about that. So, you know, President Kimball's been working with the Brazilians um, trying to get the church to change or he sees there's an error 1963 he recognizes there's an error so you've got this this person working to to overturn uh the the priesthood ban uh, behind the scenes well hubie and brown his role right now in the church when he's recognizing this say that again please what's his role in the church right now uh, uh spencer w kimball was an apostle at the time okay and hubie brown is hubie who brown is in the first presidency at the he's time in the first presidency. so okay. he's he's in the first presidency to david o mckay okay so, you know he's he's up there he's he's yeah. a, a high-ranking <laughs> person on. that's right well hubie brown recognized that this was a problem uh and and he he said we need to overturn this the the blacks need to to get the priesthood so in 1969 he, he got this group together, some BYU professors and others, and said, I want you to research this, the background of this priesthood ban so that we can understand where it came from, so we can decide whether it's policy, which we can change without a revelation, or whether it's doctrine, which requires a revel, you know, which is going to require a revelation to overturn. And so he gets this group and they write a paper and they they find in their discovery, they say, you know, there's a lot of statements about this, and this is the way we've always done it. But there never was a revelation from God that said that the blacks weren't to get the priesthood. There's just statements from the from the prophets that said they can't have it. But this looks more like a policy than a doctrine to us. Because it's so, cultural. It's just always been that way. Nobody knows why or how, but it's just very easy to let it continue being done that way. Because nobody questioned it, remember, because and nobody we learned enough. Questioned it, my goodness. From David O. McKay, so yeah. Hubie Brown, uh, David O. McKay at this time is is pretty old and he's pretty sick. Um, but so <laughs> Hubie Brown, as member of the first presidency, really has quite a bit of control. You know, as as we've seen when when our uh, presidents get sick and and that that someone else is kind of pulling the strings behind the power and, vacuum and people step up to fill it. We saw yep. that with Benson. We I think saw it a little bit with Monson. Yeah, it definitely yep. happened. And that's exactly what Hubie Brown uh, was in. So Hubie Brown goes to David O. McKay and he convinces him that this is a policy and that because it's a policy, he can make the change. And David O. McKay agrees. He says. Okay. And so they 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 get a candidate. His name was Monroe Fleming. And Monroe was a uh, an employee at the at the Hotel Utah that and and I don't imagine there were a lot of black Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City uh in 69. It you know, it was a pretty white area. But uh they found this man named Monroe Fleming, and Pre President McKay agreed that he would give him the priesthood. When Harold B. Lee, who is the senior apostle, uh, or he, he's he's next to Joseph Fielding Smith, I think, is senior apostle. So when Harold B. Lee finds out, he is furious, and he storms in, and he, he gets Joseph Fielding Smith to to back him up, who is the senior prophet uh, or senior apostle. But he's he's over ninety at this time. He was he wasn't strong enough to really fight the fight, but Harold B. Lee was. And Harold B. Lee put a stop to it, and he says this requires the unanimous agreement of all the 15 in order to, to overturn this. And since he's senior to Hubie Brown, uh, and, and they convince him, and they stop this. So amazingly, in 1969, we may have had, we were that close to having uh, a, the Blacks have the priesthood, but it was it was Harold B. Lee and Joseph Fielding Smith. The next two prophets of the church are the ones who stopped it and That's said, absolutely. absolutely not. 
And uh, it's just infighting and it's politics and it's pushing your own racist agenda. And the way the structure is set up, a few people are able to put a stop to everything. It has to be anonymous, sorry, an unanimous, not anonymous, unanimous. And it just stopped it dead in its tracks. Yeah, it, it did. And and it got even worse because um, at, we all remember uh, Uchtdorf getting released from the first presidency when Nelson took over. And they said, that hasn't happened since like 1970. Well, guess what? who it was in 1970 who got released from the first presidency? It was Hubie Brown. Mm -hmm. And it was clearly because of his stance um, on the priesthood ban. So that was his you know, trying to get the, the priesthood ban changed made him uh, lose his position in the first presidency when Joseph they, they Fielding Smith came in. put him out to pasture, I think. Yep, I, like to use a, I like to use uh, the scenario with Uchtdorf as a verb and say he got Uchtdorfed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, he did. Yeah, I, was, I was not aware of any of this Hubie Brown um, information. This This particular, what's on this slide was was very eye-opening to me. And it, it showed me that people were thinking. They did know there was a problem. They knew it was wrong. But again, infighting, politics, um, racial agendas in that we, we, environment we always, shut it down. Yeah, we always think of the apostles as a green and working together as yeah. a group. And that simply is not the case. Uh, well, they had very strong feelings. And you could tell from Stapley, uh, uh, Peterson uh, was also uh, one that uh, was completely against it. Ezra Taft Benson was very strongly against it. Uh, so you had, you had, you know, half the apostles were, were older and, and had their, uh, th they were against these policies, whereas the younger ones were seeing it and they were getting out. And the thing that got to me was the way minds usually get changed is when you get to know the people who are being discriminated against. Right, the people you don't understand or have any experience with, absolutely. And these are old white men in Utah, which is a completely white area in the in the 60s. Yeah. They have no interaction with these people, but President Kimball, or he wasn't president then, but Spencer Kimball was actually out among these people and seeing the detrimental effect that it had on the families and on the, on the members of the of the church. Right. And and I think not only not understanding or knowing um, people that you may perceive as different from you, I mean, taking ac active steps to be separate. I don't know if you want to talk about the blood bank. That was another thing that I learned that I was absolutely stunned. Yeah, it's it, it's this was in the 50s and I don't know how long it continued, but the the uh, LDS hospital back then, the church owned hospitals had a separate blood bank for blacks and whites because you could not get a transfusion or get any blood from a black man if you were a LDS priesthood holding because then you had black blood in your in you which would make you unworthy for the priesthood so and and I don't think this was limited to just the the church here in Utah I think in the south they probably had similar things right. but this just tells you how far the policy went and this is in the 50s. This is, you know, right during the civil rights movement. And this is how discriminatory uh, the, the church and its leaders were that that it was appropriate to have a, a separate blood blood bank just for that. Right. And again, and I think we said this before, the wrong side of history. And and what would seem prophetic would be to be on the right side of history when it was not popular to be on the right side and then later to be proven that you were prophetic, you were forward thinking, you saw it even when most people didn't. But in this case, it's exactly the opposite. It, it, that That's correct. And and when you start looking, uh, you know, this next slide is titled, Let's Get Political. Uh, and, and it's got a picture of Spencer W. Kimball there because what Spencer W. Kimball had to do to get this priesthood ban lifted, it looks like a senior politician trying to get a bill passed in in the united states congress a lobbyist that's what i think he had to be as a lobbyist oh yeah he and he was brilliant in some of the things that he did in order to to override uh the band um the first first thing he did when he became the the president of the church of course you know we had david o mckay who was about to give the priesthood 
Then we had Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, Harold B. Lee, who were both completely against it. Brigham Young or, or uh, uh, Spencer Kimball slips right in between between Harold B. Lee and Ezra Taft Benson. Uh, you know the two who all three of the the the, the two on both sides of him were very against uh, the blacks having the priesthood. You mean and in so, the order of seniority? He's right in between those two, and the the more senior than him will never agree, and just below him will never agree, and he's right in the middle. He's right in the middle, and so he's and and remember. After the David O. McKay fiasco, yeah. the the thing is now we have to get all the all the apostles to agree to this before we can overturn it, and that's kind of the standard that he had. And he looked out and he saw who he had there, and he had Stapley, he had uh, Peterson, he had Ezra Taft Benson, he had Bruce R. McConkey, he had a lot of these hardliners. Uh, Bruce R. McConkey had written in Mormon Doctrine that the Negroes would never get the priesthood is is what he what he put in there. And so these are the hardliners and he's got to change their mind. And so how he went about it was was brilliant. He didn't argue civil rights uh, like the United States did. He looked at it from what's this doing to the church? And so the first thing he did is when he became the president, he became the president in December of 1973. In 1974, he starts sending apostles to Brazil on assignment. He wants them to see what's going on down there. He wants them to have to figure out, how am I going to fill this role with a huge population of Black people? How do I tell these people who are coming to me and asking about inter -mar interracial marriage, which interracial marriage was, was very popular, very, you know, it happened all the time in Brazil. And so people are intermarrying. And so even if you're a, a white man and you marry someone that's got mixed race, your family can't go to the temple. You're, you're denied all of that. So he just, they just start seeing this is a problem and he's forcing the uh, apostles to, to do this. And uh, you would think that Bruce R. McConkie would be one of the last holdouts uh, to oppose this. <laughs> And he really wasn't. He was one of the first to, to come on board because when he got down there, he saw the problem. He said, this is problematic. We can't do missionary work. Right. Uh, we can't, we can't, uh, the, the members can't progress. What are we going to do here? So now that's, that's actually a brilliant tactic on President Kimball's part. Firsthand knowledge make them aware with their own eyes of the pro of the problem, make them understand that the actual progress of the church is in jeopardy, what they as apostles are committed to preserve and to move forward. And then they come up with their own solution, or at least understand that what he may be proposing or guiding them toward realizing is going to be the only thing that they can do. So that's brilliant strategy on President Kimball's part. Yeah, and the next thing he did was was just really brilliant. March 1975, he announced a temple in <laughs> Sao Paulo, Brazil. He said, we're going to build a temple there. And so they start building this temple, and he's like, now you got to do something. You know, we've got a temple going in. Who's going to staff that temple? Who's going to staff it? Who's going to go, go to it? Yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> So he, he, he kind of put him in a catch-22 there. And, and uh, in 1977, it, it's interesting because I, I really like this statement. In 1977, he, he was worried because the apostles weren't of one mind. And he said, you know, even though I'm doing this, there are holdouts that are not going to come onto my side. One of them was uh, Marky Peterson and Stapley was, no was, surprise. <laughs> was the other one. He wasn't sure about Ezra Taft Benson. And and this quote uh, this this quote came from his son's book, uh, uh, the autobiography of his father, and he he tells this quote. Uh, Spencer W. Kimball said, "I don't know that I should be the one doing this, but if I don't, my successor won't." Knowing that Ezra Taft Benson would not overturn the priesthood ban, so that really gets you thinking in a political view here that. Is this God giving a revelation? Is this God's mind, or is this, you know, the 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 men, these individual men's policies? That's what I was just going to ask because 
but God is directing the church. God speaks through the mouthpiece of the prophet. Shouldn't anything that President Kimball wants to happen, that he says, God has told me this, shouldn't that be unanimously accepted by the apostles if they believe that President Kimball is receiving direct revelation, direct guidance from God? That's the part I don't understand. Why is God at the mercy of, I'll call them 12 angry men, right? I mean, there's <laughs> a movie reference there. But why is God at the mercy of 12 angry men? And, and the prophet is in a position where he has to, you know, manipulate and cajole and use politics and lobbying. Shouldn't it just be God's word? But then I guess maybe we need to remember back where they sort of alluded that God didn't want to do it. <laughs> So well, yeah, they were the one. We've got to convince God. That was what the yeah. policy was back. You know, we got to convince right. God. Now it seems to be well. Now we've got to convince these these uh, members of the of the twelve that we right. need to turn this. And and uh, even further than that is all the twelve are supposed to be prophets, seers, and revelators, yes. and amongst themselves, they should also be getting the same right. revelation that Spencer W. Kimball's getting and saying, "Oh, the Lord wants this changed at this point." Um, Right. And I want to point out that in this time, I think a lot of people really did believe that all of these men were communicating, you know, with God or Christ, like actually face to face. I mean, when I was growing up, that was the I know a lot of people don't believe that, but that was what everyone thought in the you know room, special rooms in the temple. They really believed that it was like a sit down and there was, you know, information and direction being given. So we we thought everybody was in very close communication. So that's why it is confusing that that apostles would have to agree, they'd have to fight, they'd have to convince each other, they'd have to lobby. It, it seems strange. Yeah, and Spencer W. Kimball said, you know, during all this time that he'd go to the temple, to the upper room where they had their, uh, you know, the, their gathering area up there, and and pray and pray on this issue, and so that kind of gives you the thought that, well, why is he going to the temple specifically to pray for this? You know, because he's talking to God. Uh, I, I remember growing up that we all believed that too, that he walks and talks with God. Yeah. And so you think, Hey, he goes in there and God's going to tell him, you know, when he sees him, Hey, we need to fix this. And he should be able to go and say, the Lord told me it's time to change it and everyone should be on board, but that's not what happened at all. Uh, and he, didn't he arrange for the Lord to visit with each of the apostles and tell him what, tell them what needed to happen. It just it seems. Or shouldn't they have the faith just like the members that the prophet, what yeah. the prophet is speaking is the or word. Of once the, the prophet speaks, you know, the debate and, is over. Or whatever. It doesn't seem is. to be that way. So uh, we start get we get to 1978 and now, you know, the temple was announced in 1975 in Brazil. And here we are in 1978, the temple's getting completed. It's it's almost ready to open. It's going to open later in, in 1978. And uh, the, the, they realize all the people who were paying tithing for this temple, and back in those days, you didn't send it all into the church. You had to fund it yourself, you know, mm -hmm. so that, that area had to fund their own temple, and they had to help build the temple. They were making bricks. They were helping to build the temple. So they're giving their tithing. They're building the temple and they're being told you're not going to be able to use it. You'll never be able to. You'll never be able to use it. And so uh, it's interesting because there, there was a family down there. Um, their name were the Martins and they were educated. They were well off and they were very dedicated to the church and they were black. And they were probably the most prominent family in the church in Brazil. And so every time that that anyone went down to Brazil, any of the general authorities, uh, President Kimball made sure that they met with this family. Because, you know, it's one thing to have poor Black people not having the blessings, but these are educated, um, they're, they're smart, they're faithful, they're doing everything that's being asked of them. And yet they're being denied all of the Honestly, blessings. That's, that's what you what you just said is actually a quote from something where they said, I think I saw that document that you shared with me, where they actually said, you know, almost doesn't matter about a, you know, lower economic state. We, you know, we're concerned about the, you know, so I think you were kind of quoting that when you said that. But yeah, that one, do you remember? I don't remember what the document was, but I know you shared that with me. Yeah, so. I've, I've probably got it here somewhere. Yeah. But yeah, it was definitely in there. And, and it. 
it's it's interesting because one of the uh, going back just a step, one of the things that was said uh, is that the Lord has a lot of patience in that He'll wait for those who disagree with Him to die <laughs> so He can make a change. And it's kind of like, well, what kind of God is how yeah, powerful is the Lord if He's got to wait for them to die before they'll make? You know, we're not going to listen like, to you till these guys are dead. You know. No. Well, like I always say, God is only as powerful as the last person that says his name, right? And we have civilization after civilization where they died and their God died. So it's... And it, it just kind of shows that. Yep, absolutely. So in 19, March of 1978, they actually make a change that starts to 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 see this. So you can see the church is starting, or, or the leadership is starting to anticipate that a change is, is coming. Um and so uh, they, what they did is they allowed home teaching that blacks could go along as the junior companion in home teaching. Oh, junior. Okay. So I don't know if that's a blessing or not. Anyone who's had to go home teaching, <laughs> but uh, that's 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 what they allowed. So uh, you know, President Kimball's pushing it to try to get this to happen, but he's got a problem. He still got Stapley and he still got Marky Peterson, who are absolutely opposed to it. He was able to get uh, Benson to agree to it, um, but these other two were were strict holdouts. And remember, Stapley's the one who who wrote the letter to George Romney calling it vicious. Oh, okay, so That's same right. guy. Marky Peterson has some of the most vicious, most vile statements about blacks, and the other thing was intermarriage. He was completely, you went to hell if you married someone of the other, other race. He was, okay. he was very bigoted. And so this is, he, he has to overcome them and he can't convince them. And so what happens is come June timeframe, uh, Stapley is hospitalized. So he can't come for a vote. So president Kimball says, Mark, I need you to go down to South America to on assignment and and take care of this whatever the assignment was. So Marky e. Peterson goes out of the country and President Kimball says it's time to have a vote. And he gathers them all in the upper room and they pray uh and he, the, he receives the revelate the revelation and the other members of the quorum agree and say, yes, let's do this. And so it's passed, but it wasn't passed unanimously because two of the members of the 12, the two that were most uh, opposed, opposed, weren't there at the time. And that's that's how the structure works, that if you're physically not there, it's all right to vote. It carries, but it's just not considered unanimous, but it still carries. They don't have to wait for everyone to be there. So that's that's interesting. I didn't know that before. So I, I think they have to get kind of get the buy in. So like after the fact, after the fact. So so Peterson comes back and rumor has it that Peterson said, OK, I'm not going to overturn what the what the other brethren have have Wait, voted what for god has said <laughs> exactly i'm right? not going to override what god said <laughs> however in order to do that i want a concession and that concession is that interracial marriage still needs to be taught in the church and interestingly enough as an, as an evil as, as an evil as an evil, evil. Yes. yes and and interestingly enough on uh, the day that the, in the same Deseret News that announced the priesthood ban had been lifted, there was another article talking about the evils of interracial marriage. And the rumor is kind of that that was the concession to, to get appease, to, to appease the others. And that intermarriage, you know, that discouraging interracial marriage was very, very yeah. uh, taught taught all over when I was, a, when I was a kid. In yeah. fact, uh, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit this, but uh, when I was in high school, uh, a, a Japanese girl uh, came, uh, was, was a foreign exchange student. She was in one of my classes and we got along and we joke with each other. She spoke English pretty well. And uh, so a church, uh, a, a school dance came and she 
wanted to go to a school dance and experience that. And she asked me to the, to the dance. And I had been taught that we don't date outside of our race. I had been taught that. And I, I didn't want to go home and tell my mom that uh, I'm going with someone of a different race. And I, I, I basically told her, Oh, I have to work. I can't get it off. And, and I didn't do it. And I, I feel horrible to this day because here's a girl who wanted to have an American experience and she, she liked me enough that she, you know, chose me as the, it was a girl's choice dance that she chose me to, to be the one. And, and I turned her down and it didn't matter I, at all. like it, it didn't matter. There was no reason that you should have said no. What's no, so no, not at all. It, it uh, I, I know exactly that my, the thought my is, Oh, I've been taught, you know, this is, we yeah. don't, we don't, date outside our race. That's what right. I was you taught. That your family would be, would be upset or wondering, you know, just maybe not completely on board. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, I may be discounting my parents, you know, maybe right. they would have said, Oh, that's nice that you did that. But having been taught that I right away said, Oh, I can't do that. That's not allowed in, in our religion. And I, I step no, back. I think people have, I, I know people have said, I don't think that was really a thing or that wasn't really taught. But for people of a certain age, like me, and I'm older than Landon, um, it was very real. You know, I had awesome parents, wonderful parents, kind parents, did um, everything for everybody. But whenever there was an opportunity, they would point out that that is something that's very wrong. There was an interracial couple in my neighborhood. And I, when I was very young let's see seven yeah like I probably would have been 10 or so they had a red convertible and I remember thinking that was amazing and so you could spot them in the neighborhood when they were driving around but every time we saw them my parents would make sure to say that is not what we're supposed to do they would tell me that and I remember that to this day and that's decades ago so it was very real that that agenda was being pushed to people and and I I remember at least in my experience and in yeah. Landon's experience growing up in the seventies, they were talking about it as something that that was discouraged. Yes, and 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 the it was very out there the racial discrimination. I you know I I grew up in Utah in the seventies, and I remember there was, was a couple songs that had, uh, you know, not the great words. And, yeah, and, and kids would sing them all the time. Uh, yeah. and and that was. We the just, culture there you, yeah, they didn't you weren't know. taught that was wrong and so right. you know i i look back at that and i say you know cow i just why would i do that but you were taught yeah. that you know yeah. and and so you understand why well, it was you acceptable do. you know nobody yeah. checked you on it and it was acceptable so and, and but by the 80s that had pretty much changed yeah. i went into the exactly. military in the 80s or yeah in the 80s i started in school and i was in in the military part-time and and uh you know, I was meeting uh, a lot of black people who, who were in the military and great people, you know, and, and didn't matter anymore. Yeah, yeah it didn't matter. You said, hey, this is a great guy, you know, so the the, the attitudes really changed from yeah. 78 to 80 something they, in, they really in my did. Utah thing, because this policy had changed. And now we we started being more accepting than we yeah. had been previous. So do I, you do you remember uh, when it was announced over the pulpit. And also another question, and maybe we'll cover this on the next slide. So they voted and that's great. How does that become an announcement? Do they say we have received a revelation or did they say we have voted? I can't remember the wording of it. I do remember being at the meeting, 78, I would have been 12, almost 13. And so I do remember being there and I remember, you know, everybody raising their hand. I didn't exactly understand what was happening. But I did I did take note that it was something fairly momentous. And you were younger, of course. So do you have a memory of being? Yeah, I was I was nine and I remember it happening. And I remember everyone going, oh, you know, it was yeah. a big deal. Yeah, we've been waiting. Everybody said we've been pleading. Yes. We've been, you know, we <laughs> I didn't recognize the significance of it, you know, because I was only nine. And, uh, right. you know, you did, didn't even know about these things at that age. But uh, but I remember for the next several years it was it was a pretty big deal uh, in the church. So, but did you ever understand that it was a vote? I don't believe that I really no. understood that. I really thought it was here's this revelation and they announced it. I think I really thought that's how it worked. Well, they they you know they call it the revelation yes. and 
you know, he said they, he went into the temple and he prayed with the, yeah. you know, in the in the upper room pleading, with the I think twelve they used and pleading, and then yes. the spirit came upon them and yes. let him know that this was right. But of course, they did that with shipping off, you know, making sure two of the apostles weren't there to <laughs> pulling the strings. The, the spirit couldn't be it. there with those two apostles were there, there. You know, <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's it's definitely fascinating situation. It, it was a horrible situation, and yes. uh, but but President Kimball on June seventeenth, they they lifted the ban, and it was in a letter that's called the Official Declaration Two, uh, where they say you know it's been named known that all worthy uh, men can be priesthood holders. It's interesting. Um, I don't. They don't make a big deal about the fact that families can now be sealed together. It's more the men can have the priesthood. Well, no, I can tell you why, because they don't want to draw attention to the fact, because a lot of people didn't realize that's why I call it the eternal family ban. A lot of people didn't really realize that's what it meant. They literally just thought, oh, he can't go to, you know, he doesn't have the priesthood. They didn't think it through to its yep. natural conclusion. So if they started listing off, now you can this and this and this, I think people would then see... And maybe I wish they would have, because then people would see everything that was lost for decade after decade after decade. Yeah. And, and I remember, you know, the point this really hit home to me, I remember sitting in in uh, in Sunday school. Uh, this is when I'm, you know, in my 40s. Uh, and and we had a lesson on the priesthood ban. And, you know, everyone, they kind of went around the room, and said, who remembers this? And people would tell stories and they'd say, oh, my mother, she had a dream that they were going to get it and she prayed and she fasted and she waited for this day to come. And other people would go, oh, we were so happy. We were so glad. And it came to me and I said, did anyone say anything? Did anyone say this isn't right? Did no, the key words are up? waiting, waiting and praying are the key words, not action, not acting, no yeah. action. Just waiting. That was the key. It basically goes right back to the statement of, of uh, I think it was David O. McKay. You know, we nobody bothered to ask <laughs> that whether whether it was right. And that was one of the turning points for me in my journey out of the church was I realized I said, number one, these men who are prophets did not lead here. They had the chance to lead. And it's 1978, you know, 64, 65 is when the civil rights were passed. You know, right. and talking... prior to that, people were, you know, fighting and striving and trying to pass legislation. I mean, people were waking up and they were trying to make that difference. And and, and not just black people. There were a right. lot of white people supporting That's it. what yeah. I'm saying. Like the whole population were on board and understood. So you're right. Not leading following finally once it was all a done deal and once it was <laughs> finally safe okay <laughs> and, and even then it's it's the the thing that i realized is if it hadn't have been for spencer w kimball this probably would have gone on easily into the 80s through ezra taft benson's oh. and it probably would have been up to monson before uh because howard w hunter was too uh, too but short. Or Hinkley, I'm sorry, uh, up to Hinkley, Hinkley to make the change. So, but how could it? By that point, members of the church would have been so ostracized, um, you know, socially and at work if they belong to a church that is that, you know, discriminatory at that point. I feel a lot of people probably would have left because how how could you, how could that be? <laughs> you know, yeah. that overtly discriminatory when, you know, the rest of the world had moved on. But but I find it hard to believe that Ezra Taft Benson would have, when we all know how, uh, you know, conservative and and he was more that the civil rights movement was a communist ploy than really. Yes, he was more concerned about communism than race, wasn't yeah. he? As it always was. So, wow. so that is so. It, it, it's fascinating. So well, it is, and I I sense, and I think a lot of people do parallels today, but different. There different. is, as and that's as why the membership is responding. Our last slide is lessons learned, and yeah. and these are these are what I wrote down, and you may have different ones, but you know, as I as I looked over all of the things when I researched this, I said, you know, what lessons have I learned? And one is the Lord's due time includes waiting out the deaths of those individuals whose convictions present a roadblock to change. 
And the reason that I have on this slide, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment and the LBGTQ uh, flag is because these are the same issues right now that, that the Blacks and the Priesthood was back in the 60s and the 70s. A disenfranchised population for no reason whatsoever. That is making that is making huge strides in the in the in the world in the secular world, right? But are being left behind by the church. And right. anyone who looks at this can see that number one, women are going to have to get the priesthood at some point. You look <laughs> at the women. I think half of the missionaries going out are women now. Yeah. And so if your missionary force, half of them can't baptize, half of them can't right. do that. You've got a lot of single mothers uh, yep. that now there's no priesthood in their home. So they're being denied that. Right. Uh, no, we talked about the junior companion, that little concession. That reminded me of how now in the mission field, sisters have higher, much higher leadership roles. You know, they're 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 basically like, I think district, they're called sister leadership. Anyway, there's a little S, it's a it's an acronym. Um, but they have higher leadership yeah. roles, you know, and women are now can witness baptisms, you know, and women who are in a presidency are called presidents. So it reminds me of that, these little tiny baby steps. But I will tell you, I taught primary for years and years because that was like the last calling that I would say, OK, I'll do that. You know, still trying to kind of stay in, easing out. And I had a lot of little girls in my classes, just strong, fierce. And I could tell that in every other aspect of their life, they were never told there was something they couldn't do. No one at school told them that. No one at home told them that. In fact, they got the exact opposite message. You can do everything that anybody else can do. And I'm telling you, when we would have these lessons about the priesthood, some of these little girls had no idea that they were not going to get it. They really did. They'd say, well, when I get the priesthood, or I'm excited for, you know, when it happens to me, and that told me that their parents didn't know, you know, in this world of you can do anything, you know, girls and boys, no difference. Um, they didn't know how to tell them or explain to them that no, there is a difference. And it's going to be a big difference nowhere else. But here at church, there's going to be a difference. So I almost felt like it was it was one of those, you know, talking about sex. Go home and ask your parents, you know, about the <laughs> priesthood. I don't want to be the one to break that to you. But it was very surprising to me because when I was growing up, of course, in the 60s, you know, in the 70s, you knew, you know, you were a woman in the church and you understood your role and you just knew it. And your parents had no trouble telling you, you know, that you're separate but equal, all of that. But boy, these little girls that I taught over the last decade or so, fierce. And I'm telling you, when they're older, there's going to be changes. Yeah. And the women are definitely, you know, bringing in, you know, most houses, they're bringing in a, a large part of the income for the family. Absolutely. In some cases, they're the major breadwinner. Um, and you're seeing that more and more. They're more educated at this point. Uh, the the people getting bachelor's degrees, women are higher than men at this point and getting bachelor's degrees. Yeah. Um, so you're definitely seeing that change and, and it's, it's going to, they can't hold off forever. Uh, people are going to say, no, that's, that's not right. And, mm -hmm. and that, you know, with the LBGTQ, we, we obviously see a lot of change and a lot of things happening there, but I, I almost think that the women thing would hap happen first, because if the woman, if the women get the priesthood, now you don't have the issue with LBGTQ if you have a transgender person. Right. Now it's not an issue. It's like everyone we everyone has the priesthood. Everyone, everyone has the priesthood. So it doesn't matter what you do identify as, you can have the priesthood. So yeah. no, but, I see it all coming to. I know it will. And it's unfortunate that things move so slowly because when it moves slowly, there's so much pain, you know, on, on so many sides over these issues and the being disenfranchised. Well, we're, so. we're in the same place David O. McKay same was place. when yeah. he had the chance to overturn it. Yeah. You, you look out and you say, we, we all know it's got to change. So yeah. why doesn't the prophet make the change now? What's the hold up? 20 years yeah. earlier, stop all the pain, stop all of that, because you know what's coming. But again, we're waiting for the hardliners to die off and a yeah. new breed to come in. To, yeah. to make these changes. And it's well, like kind of Holland, like Holland says, um, the church is 20 years behind. Do you remember that video yeah. where he said the church is always, you know, and they accept that and they're, they're rolling with that. I think the difference here is that there are so many people that are actively not just waiting and praying, 
they're talking about it. They're doing things. They're creating groups of support, groups of awareness. They are making sure that the issue is not buried. The issues are always out in the forefront and they're actively, you know, championing, champ championing ing i can't even talk by the end of the broadcast um change don't you see that don't you find oh, yeah. that instead of like it used to be you know after the fact oh i was hoping and no one ever knew that that's how they felt that they wanted the band to be lifted but today people are very openly saying this has got to change whether and, that makes a difference i don't know and i think the difference between 1970 and and today in 1978 the priesthood ban was lifted and then people left the church. Yeah. Today, people are leaving the church because they aren't making the change. They are. Absolutely. That is a And that's absolutely. what's going to force them to make the change yeah. because that they're going to lose too many people. There's too many families, too many friends that are LBGTQ that people are saying this is a wonderful person. Uh, the same thing as building the temple. Uh, how they if they come to yeah. church and pay tithing and participate, why are we why are Why? we discriminating yeah. against them and saying that they can't do this? So. Exactly. And again, well, culturally and socially, things have moved forward. And so there has to be a catch up and a quick catch up because yeah. people aren't going to stand for it. So it, and it I, I, I would wonder what it can affect your job. If you know, <laughs> people find out you're a member of a church that discriminates against yeah. LBGTQ, you yeah. know, yeah. what do you and say? The thing is, it's very public. The church is known for Prop 8. Like yep. that was a huge blunder, right? Yep. It's known for Prop 8. It's known for things like that. Um, in fact, it did affect people, people that donated to Prop 8. Do you remember this? Yes. <laughs> and then, and then the, they got a hold of the donation list and they publicized that. And people who thought they were donating in private. Um, and a lot of those donations were, were really, you know, like you'd be called to a meeting in California. Yeah. A state they twisted meeting, your arm. State, they would, they would, um, yeah, they would invite the top tithe payers and, and they did, they definitely, you know, like a lot of people weren't just saying, I feel strongly. They were like, well, I was asked to do it. And then ramifications later, because there they are on a list of somebody that opposed this. So yep. very yep. interesting, but wow. I just, all this information that, and, and everybody should know that Landon is the true scholar of Mormonish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he gathers all this information and we talk about it and, and yeah, he's amazing as far as everything that he's been able to draw together in one place, just that timeline. I'm not, I was not aware of a lot of those points on the timeline. And I think a lot of our listeners um, aren't either. So well, it was, it was really interesting as I was digging into it. I just kept going, wow, I didn't know this. Wow. You know, and, yeah. and, uh, and so I guess the last couple lessons that learned is revelation is the mind and will of the Q15, uh, not the mind and the will of the Lord, uh, <laughs> because you have to change all of their minds. Uh, the, the other lesson is that doctrine can, in fact, be changed. Something that we call doctrine can be changed. So uh, the LBGTQ, they have hope that, uh, you know, we're saying that it's a doctrine, that it's a sin, uh, but... That can be changed. And and there's some interesting people who've floated some interesting ideas of how that can be changed and be scripturally supported. And that's maybe for another show. I think we've got someone we're yeah, trying no, to Yeah, no, we are talking. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm in, I actually just contacted him today, and we may have him on soon, on soon because there are some people that are very interested in this and looking at how doctrinally things could change quite easily if you looked yeah. at it in a certain way. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the other ones are culture and political change are always eventually accepted by the church years later. You look at the polygamy, you look at the civil rights, you look at what's going to happen here. Uh, that it's inevitable. It's, it's going inevitable. to happen. It, it's, it's going to happen. happen. And the right. last thing is the Lord and his servants don't lead, they follow. It seems like it's always at a safe place or when, or when they absolutely have to be forced to do it. Uh, you know, polygamy, they were forced to do it. Uh, and and civil rights, they, you know, they made the change because of the, you know, that's how he convinced the church. That's how President Kimball convinced the leaders of the church to change was he used the church itself to yeah, the health of the, the church, church to make him world. change. Yep. But yep, it that's wasn't what's key. Gotta have to keep that stone right rolling. So <laughs> yes. It, it wasn't this is the right thing to do. 
And no. God does not discriminate against people. And we look at the scriptures and we can see that God doesn't discriminate them against them. So we're going to have to make a change. Yeah, no, that was uh, not. It was, well, okay, everyone else is on board. Now we better. Uh, it was It was almost the same thing with the vaccine. You know, it was like, oh, my okay, goodness. everybody else has accepted this. Uh, so now, now, gonna say it. Yeah. now we're going to say you should do it, you know. Yeah, and I have to say, I've, I've never heard more people say, well, I don't think I have to do it because of personal revelation. It really kind of brought personal revelation out to the forefront as people chose to disagree with the prophet. And that that's an interesting thing because, you know, that that may be something that we, you know, that that may get get momentum as people say, you know, they said this, but I personally don't feel that way. You know, and then people are becoming more and more comfortable saying that. Which and and that, allies of LBGTQ are also becoming more comfortable to say this, this isn't right. Yep. Uh, yep. And they're very outspoken and, yeah. and everybody's saying it how it is. So, wow. Well, what an episode that is. That is amazing. Thank you for all of your research and everything that you did. Do you have any final thoughts or we'll just say happy Martin Luther King Day on Monday and uh, we'll call it a wrap. <laughs> yep. I guess we could say free at last, free at last. Oh. God almighty, I'm free yep. at last. <laughs> yep, I think we can. No, thank you everybody for listening. We'd love to hear um, in the comments, your experiences, your thoughts. I know these are extremely difficult issues. There's a lot of information out there, some of it very hard to read and disturbing. You know, some of these quotes that we showed, you know, just can't even believe it. So yeah, please comment. Uh, please tell us uh, what you're thinking. So we'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.